pond moss, tricks to grow huge bluegill. Three, two, Hey, Mr. Pond Boss, tell me what to do to make all my Lunker Lake dreams come true. Hello, everybody. Good to see you. Chico, how's it going, man? It's going very good. Thank you. I'm glad to be hanging out with you again. It's fun. Let's, uh, let's talk about the hottest topic on the planet. Not, what is the hot topic? <laughs> not growing giant bluegills. You know... Uh-huh. Cool. But you know, I'll tell you, um, as I travel the nation, it's interesting to me to see the regional preferences. You know, it, when you get into Nebraska, people care a lot less about largemouth bass. They call them green trout. Mm-hmm. You know, you get to the Dakotas, Minnesota, and that area, they're considered trash fish by a lot of people. You know, walleye, that's the big fish there. Yeah. In the Midwest, bluegills are pretty popular. And I, I tell you, folks... And I, I would challenge anybody out there, raise your hand, tell me the very first fish you ever caught. And I just about bet it's a bluegill or some kind of a panfish. I know the first fish I ever caught were bluegills and green sunfish and panfish like that. A cooler full. Yes. Yeah. And you can catch a lot of them when you can catch them. You know, but it's very rare to catch a big one. And I tell you, it used to, when I say used to, this is my 43rd year is a private fisheries biologist traveling the nation, designing fishing lakes and publishing Pond Boss magazine. And in my travels, uh, giving speeches like this, I would get in front of a crowd and I'd say, hey, you know, talking about bluegills, I have probably held 15 or 20 bluegills, pound and a half to two pounds in my entire life. I held a lot of pound and a quarter bluegills, one pound bluegills. You can grow one pound bluegills. And then about 2005, six, and seven, that all changed. It all changed <laughs> on a lake in North Carolina because it, uh, I was helping manage a lake over there that had acid water, high flow rates. We couldn't do the traditional things like fertilizing and liming and, and those things. Couldn't do that over there because the flow rate and the water was acidic. 5.3, we've, it's just, just barely high enough the fish can be able to reproduce, you know, but what, so that lake became dependent on a good fish food. So I got with Purina Mills and started working with them on some of their feed products. And we tried to come up with a more complete food for bluegills because we wanted to feed the bluegills so they could reproduce more and provide a food chain for feed train largemouth bass that we had stocked in that lake. Well, we get about three or four years down the road and I get a picture one day from the lake owner. And he's caught a two-pound bluegill. Well, I didn't see that coming. Well, we fast forward a few years. Yeah, you know, a a two-pound bluegill Mm -hmm. is 12 inches long, Mm -hmm. drapes over a dinner plate. I mean, Mm -hmm. those things are that big and about that thick. You know, that's a big bluegill. So over time, with a feeding strategy, and we were pretty aggressive with the feed because we could, we grew some bluegill beyond three pounds in that lake. So I want to give folks some tips on growing really giant bluegills today. Greetings, Bob Lusk here, editor of Pond Boss Magazine and longtime fisheries biologist. Welcome to the Pond Boss Podcast Series. Got some great topics lined up for you. Glad you're coming along. We are brought to you by Purina Mills, makers of Aquamax Fish Foods, Texas Hunter Products, makers of fantastic fish feeders and other hunting products, Easy Docs, and HuntBirdDog.com. We're glad you're here. Let's go have some fun together and get our learning curve up. Now, I love those fish. You know, you get a two-pound bluegill on a five-weight fly rod, on light tackle, on a popping bug, you're going to giggle like a seventh grader at a sleepover. You're not going to stop. Yeah. You're not going to stop. Yeah. And I mean, when those things Mm -hmm. hit, they start swimming in a clockwise circle, pulling, you know, a two pound bluegill pulls like a five pound bass, you know, and then when you catch one and you know the odds it overcame to get to be that big, Mm -hmm. that's pretty cool. So here's some tips on how to grow giant bluegills. First of all, bluegills reproduce a lot. Now, here in Texas, they may reproduce three to five times a year. 
Oklahoma, Missouri, two to three times a year. You get above the Mason-Dixon line once, maybe twice a year. So their reproductive capabilities are pretty high. So we know that when you have so many mouths to feed and so much food, that when you've got too many fish, they're just not going to get very mm -hmm. big. So number one, you got to be able to manage their numbers. Well, the traditional way to do that is to have overcrowded bass. So it's real common to have overcrowded largemouth bass, and you start seeing these big 9, 10, 11 inch bluegills, you know, that weigh three quarters to a pound and a quarter. That's, that's what you see. So the number one tip is you got to have overcrowded bass. Okay. The second tip is that you want to uh, recruit. You want to add new bluegills from time to time. Like what we did with this lake in North Carolina, we had a separate hatchery pond. We had two of those where we could grow some bluegills and then we could get them up to sizes that were big enough that they could have some survival rate and the best of the best would be stocked into the lake. The rest would get eaten in the lake. And so we always had some recruitment going on. To where keep at, bait fish going? To keep young bluegills coming up the pipeline. Okay. okay, so there's a balancing act of trying to be sure that you've got enough young bluegills to fill the slots of the aging bluegills. Bluegills live six to eight years. That's it. So you've got to help help manage their over-reproduction. Then you've got to give them the opportunity to grow large. And you've got to have the right nutrition for them. So there's a number of really good fish foods. I prefer Aquamax uh, MVP because it's got nine different pellet sizes. So if you want to try to grow some big bluegills, stock native species of bluegills. Uh, you know, we hear a lot about copper nose bluegills. Copper nose bluegills work great where it's warm. They don't work at all. If, if you, if you, if we draw a line about 60 miles south of Oklahoma city, coming through Little Rock, Arkansas, going up to Nashville, Tennessee, and then moving up to Eastern seaboard, East and south of that line, copper nose bluegills can do really well. But you get above that line, there's going to be some winter times when they'll perish because they don't like cold weather. So the, all the more reason to be stocking native strains of bluegill that are native to your range. If your bluegill don't get to be a pound and a half, it's not because of the genetics, it's because of the environment. So you got to have the right kind of environment and you got to have some overcrowded bass. If you've got those things, if you've got crowded bass, and so people say, how do I do that and manage the bass? Well, one traditional way to do that is to get your bluegill established and to stock some um, adult male bass. You know, maybe eight or 10 per acre. That's all it takes. So if your focus is on growing bigger bluegill, you have to have enough bass to help keep the bluegill numbers in check. You know, because if you have male bass and female bass, they begin to reproduce. Mm -hmm. The bigger, the big females have a tendency to eat some of your bigger bluegills before they have a chance to really to grow to maturity. You know, so it's a, it's a balancing act. And the amount of dedication you're willing to give is going to help determine the results you're going to get. Now, you can feed bluegills and get them up to that two pounds. And it's going to take three or four years, probably more like four or five years in most cases, if the competition for food is pretty intense. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the tricks to the trade, you got to pay attention to water quality. Everywhere I go, I preach about happy water. If the water's not happy, the fish aren't going to be happy. I'll tell you somebody that's really doing a good job, look at the Slab Lab. Check out Sarah Parvin, the closer. She's, she's a good marketer, and her, she and her dad are growing some huge fish. So not only are they growing some big fish, she is showing them where people can see them. You know, and they're on their, their goal is to try to break the world record. And I hope they do. It sounds mm. like they can, but you never know, you know. So uh, if you do all the right things and they've got overcrowded bass, they're feeding a high quality fish food. They work with American Sport Fish Hatchery to help manage their water quality and cull bluegills. So just like in, in podcasts I've talked before, just because the fish have the genetic quality to get to be huge doesn't mean they will. There's a term in biology called plasticity. You can take a thousand bluegills, stock them into your pond, and about 30% of those fish are going to thrive in your pond. Mm -hmm. You can take that same thousand bluegills, Chico, and move them into a creek. About 300 of those are going to thrive, but it'll be a different 300 than the 300 that thrives in that pond. Hmm. So those, those fish, 
Each have a little different innate inherited ability to survive in that environment. So as long as you can provide the environment, make sure they've got some food that they need all the time, which uh, Dr. Bruce Candelo up in Lincoln, Nebraska, part of the way he feeds this bluegill is he has some lights on his dock, which that attracts zooplankton that's feeding on phytoplankton. And there's probably six or eight weeks out of the year where he's got all these magic critters that are swimming in that light at night and the bluegill pick them off and gorge themselves. So he's working with his water quality to grow some more insects mm -hmm. and then using mechanical devices to push those insects and attract them in to where his, no, his, where his bluegill are hanging out. Mm -hmm. So there's all kinds of cool strategies you can use, but the fundamentals are you got to manage their ability to reproduce by having a way to eradicate, get eaten, harvest the young of the year that aren't growing fast enough. Then you protect your bluegills long enough that they can get big, and then you feed them well. And if you don't do those things while you're keeping the water happy, you can grow some giant bluegills. And there's nothing more fun for me than to watch my grandkids catch their first fish off the dock, and it be about a seven or eight inch bluegill. It's really fun. So hey, listen, go to pondboss.com, check us out there. We've got a really active discussion forum, a lot of free articles, uh, our YouTube channel. You can connect to all of our different videos from there and uh, these podcasts as well. So thanks for checking in with us. And Chico, it's been a joy. I know I didn't let you talk much, but... Uh, oh, I'm learning. I love it. I love it. <laughs> but I see you soaking it in. And when you got something to say, you're going to say it. Yeah, I do. So folks, yeah. thanks for joining in. We'll see you on the next one. Wow, that was pretty fun, huh? I'm so glad that you joined us. Say, if you're looking for more information, I want you to head over to pondboss.com. We've got all kinds of cool information and been there forever. It's got some of the best articles, topics, got the Ask the Boss discussion forum. And be sure to check out the Institute of Higher Pondology online as well. And subscribe to Pond Boss Magazine. That's what fuels the economy of what we're doing to help us put these shows on. So until next time, we'll see you then. Hey, Mr. Pond Boss, tell me what to do to make all my Lunker Lake dreams come true.